Hi, my name is Koen Vogel. I'd like to talk to you about the causes of climate change. So what do you know about climate change and how did you form your opinion? If you're like most people, you probably believe that the Earth's recent warming episode is caused by atmospheric increases in carbon dioxide or CO2. And you probably formed that opinion because it's been repeated so often by politicians, by the news media, by your egghead friends in the, in the coffee house, by your Uncle Bob, etc., etc. All these people who have formed an opinion despite never having read any reports on climate change or having even spoken to a climate scientist. This consensus opinion that CO2 is causing climate change can be traced back to a, a series of reports by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is a bit of a mouthful, so I'll just call them IPCC from here on in. We published a set of reports uh, which remains today the still, still the most comprehensive and authoritative work on climate change. Uh, you can download these reports at ipcc.ch free of charge. And the most, the most important one as far as today's uh, video is concerned is volume 10, which deals with the climate change attribution, or the causes of climate change. Well, let me just read to you from this report, I'm quoting directly from the report here. More than half of the observed increase in global mean surface temperature, or GMST, as you'll see it abbreviated uh, in the presentation, from 1951 to 2010, 2010 is the date that they published the report, is very likely due to the observed anthropogenic increase in greenhouse gas concentrations. You'll see greenhouse gas abbreviated as GHG in the presentation. So anthropogenic means man-made, and greenhouse gases are a collection of molecules in the atmosphere that have the ability to capture heat energy, notably CO2 or carbon dioxide. So to paraphrase a bit, to paraphrase the IPCC a bit, CO2 increases are the dominant cause of global warming. So most of the people who have an opinion on the cause of global warming, possibly even your egghead friends down at the coffee shop, have never read the reports, have never spoken to a climate scientist, and are probably just parroting what they think is conventional wisdom CO2 is causing climate change. So I'd like to challenge you. Despite your possibly very strong beliefs on the subject, have you ever seen any of the evidence that the IPCC are basic, basing their conclusions on? Would you like to? Because I have read the reports and I've reviewed their volume 10, which deals with climate change attribution. So listen and see if you agree with the IPCC methodology and conclusions. I'll use the same data sets they use from reliable data sources such as NOAA and NASA and so on, but exactly the same data sources. Uh, many of my critical conclusions will be echoed by the IPCC reports themselves. I'll often use quotes directly from the report, which echo that they have also seen what their significant shortcomings are. The last part of the video will show some recent data, also from very reliable sources, which show beyond any scientific doubt that global warming is not happening due to increases in greenhouse gases. If you can't wait that long, just skip to the last 10 minutes of the video. You'll be convinced that there's another force in play, a natural force which is heating the earth. Will this presentation get technical? Well, yeah, that's unavoidable, but I'll try to make the science understandable to anyone who's completed their high school. So if it's not CO2, then what is it? I mentioned that there's another natural force in play, and I have a second video that deals with that natural forcing. I guarantee you this is not going to be another conspiracy theory, wild goose chase, where at the end of the day, you'll learn that it's an Illuminati heat ray on the dark side of the moon that's causing global warming. You'll see data and evidence in the second companion video that demonstrates that there's a good, statistically significant correlation between recent global energy changes and a major natural forcing that the IPCC climate modelers have ignored. I split the video into two parts and this one demonstrates that it's not CO2. So to persuade you to invest your time in watching these videos, I'd like to preview some of the data from the second video. The first graph shows the global mean surface temperature anomalies from 1900 to 2019, that's these dots here, as well as a smoothed version of the data, which is a solid line, as downloaded from NASA, from their web server. You see the global mean surface temperature on the vertical axis here, and the years from 1900 to 2019 along the horizontal axis. I'll explain what temperature anomalies are in a bit. I selected the 1900 to 2019 interval because it contains two main recent warming periods. You'll see the 1909 to 1943, 
increase when the Earth warmed about point or half a degree Celsius. And there's the recent uh, global warming period from 1980 to now, basically, where the temperature increased by 0.6 degrees by 2010. And as you see, it's probably still increasing uh, currently. So two warming set periods, which are separated by a cooling period where the Earth cooled 0.2 degrees Celsius. And in the, during the 60s and 70s, there's a bit of fluctuating up and down, uh, but remaining more or less uh, constant. So now let's look at the second curve, which shows you atmospheric CO2 concentrations in parts per million on the vertical axis, and years between 1900 and 2019, once again, on the horizontal axis. The data source is from NASA and NOAA, once again, so reliable. The shape of the curve is it remains relatively flat until 1960, after which it starts a fairly steep increase. Now the shape is problematic because it, it highlights the problem that the IPCC climate models are experiencing. Any increase in temperature due to an increase in CO2 will likely mirror this curve. And you can fit uh, a, a curve similar to this through the 1909 to 1943 data, or you could fit it through the 1980 to 2019 data, but you can't do both. And what about this period where the Earth cooled 0.2 degrees Celsius? remained relatively flat during the 1960s and 70s. How does that fit with an increase in CO2 values? I'll show you with the problems that this causes the IPCC climate models in a bit, but spoiler alert, it causes our climate models to be wildly off. All right, now let me show you the preview from the second video. Have a look at this graph, which shows you a variable of a natural force. The data source is once again from NOAA, so a reliable data source shows you the variations of this natural variable, once again, over the same period, 1900 to 2019. It's, a, it's the subject of the companion video. Uh, the graph reflects the measured changes in a variable that I believe is a major cause of global warming. You see the increases and decreases much better match the global temperature fluctuations. So you can see the 1909 to 1943 increase. You see the decrease following Second World War. You see a bit of a muddle, 60s and 70s, and then you see the sharp increase after 1980. So which curve would you rather use to predict GMST variations? The next video will show you there's a good statistically significant correlation between this variable and global energy variations. So it's not just visual. There's actually numbers behind this which indicate that the two are correlated. I'll prove in the next video that there's actually a causal relationship as well. This natural variable is causing energy changes and it's causing climate change. This video will demonstrate there's almost a perfect non-correlation between atmospheric CO2 concentrations and global mean surface temperature variations. So let's dive right in. Why does the IPCC believe that an increase in anthropogenic or man-made greenhouse gases is causing the Earth to warm? Well, let's go directly to their climate change report. And I quote, Greenhouse gas attribution is based on the consistency of observed and modeled changes across the climate system. So climate models play an important role in the attribution process. They model the changes and they compare them to the observations and say the two are very similar. A model, in the climate model sense of the word, describes the physics of what scientists think is happening. A numerical model is a mathematical representation of these physics. So climate models simulate climate physics. There's energies coming in, there's energies going out, these energies interact with one another, and they interact with the Earth. The physics and mathematics are then coded in a computer program, which is used to simulate and predict climate change outcomes. So climate models can be very complex and often cater for a large set of unknowns, for example, uncertainty about the physics, or they should be mathematically represented or coded. Uh, some equations can be very difficult to solve. There's uncertainty about the input parameters, how best to use the model output, so on. There's a lot of decisions that need to be made when using these climate models. The output is not exact. Note that many organizations and countries have their own climate models, and some have several, but that the latest IPCC climate attribution report focuses mainly on nine climate models and their average. Now, as a modeler, this is a red flag. Why do you need 30 plus models? Why are you using results from nine different ones? These models are very complex and time and money intensive. They can often cost millions of dollars to create and maintain. So why do you need nine of them? Can't we just focus on the best one? 
As a modeler, I can tell you that getting even one climate model to work properly is an enormous task. The only reason you need a new model, or a different model, is if the physics in one doesn't match the physics in the other. It highlights a disagreement among the IPCC climate scientists on the physical processes that cause climate change now best to represent them. Let's take a look at the energy balance of our world. Note that the IPCC called changes in these energies climate forcings. So climate forcing, it's a bit of a fancy word, represent energy variations that force the climate to change. The main energy source that reaches the Earth's surface is the solar radiation energy, electromagnetic energy, or sunlight. Now part of this radiation is reflected back by the Earth's atmosphere and its surface, as shown here. The measure of this reflectivity is called the albedo, which varies from like location to location. Dark bodies like roads and oceans, they can absorb energy much better than lighter bodies, such as snow or cumulus clouds, uh, that reflect much of the energy. The Earth re-emits some of its absorbed energy as heat, which scientists term outgoing long-wave radiation. Now, anyone who's walked barefoot across a road that's been baking in the sun knows that heat transfer can be convective. The heat transfers directly from the road to the soles of your feet, or scorches your feet. If you hold your hand above the road, though, it's, your hand's not touching it, but you can still feel heat radiating from the hot surface. So heat is radiated from the hot road and from other objects that have absorbed solar radiation to the cold atmosphere via outgoing long-wave radiation. Some atmospheric elements called greenhouse gases, such as water vapor, CO2, and methane, can absorb some of this outgoing energy. The IPCC believe that the energy absorbed by these greenhouse gases is re-emitted or radiated back to the Earth's surface, hence the term radiative forcing from greenhouse gases. So the Earth's surface emits heat, it's captured by the greenhouse gases, and is radiated back to the Earth's surface, which once again reabsorbed is the IPCC physical model. So which climate forcings are modeled? The IPCC recognized two main categories of forcings, the natural uh, forcings and the anthropogenic forcings. We've already seen one of the natural forcings, sunlight. The other natural forcing is volcanic forcing, which is due to large volcanic eruptions. The, these eruptions emit particles into the atmosphere that largely limit the amount of sunlight that reaches the Earth's surface. For example, Mount, Mount Pinatubo in 1991 was one such eruption. The anthropogenic forcings, we've already seen one of those as well. That's radiative forcing due to greenhouse gases. The other one is other anthropogenic forcings, which is a catch-all, which includes things such as aerosols, man-made aerosols, which often act in a fashion similar to volcanic forcing, that they limit the amount of sunlight that reaches the Earth's surface. Now, an underlying assumption to all the climate models is that if these energies remain the same, that the Earth will reach some kind of natural balance or a steady state, and the Earth's average temperature will remain relatively constant for, for decades on end. The temperature change is then attributed to variations in these energies, the climate forcings, as the IPCC call them. This way of working eliminates the need to determine the actual natural steady state balance. The Earth's average temperature is about 14 degrees Celsius, but to calculate why that is, is complex. In fact, it was this calculation that stumped Fourier, one of the great mathematicians of the 19th century, and caused him to formulate the greenhouse gas theory. The IPCC climate change attribution studies focus on the variability of key climate forcings, so focus on the changes in energy which are causing the climate to change. For this reason, climate data is often presented as anomalies relative to a selected multi-decadal average. We saw in the GMST data before that 1951 to 1980 was selected as, as an average temperature. So a straw man, a proxy for the steady state. This is done because we're mainly interested in change. If we consider the 1951 to 1980 temperatures to be average, then we can see that after 1980, the temperature was above average, and determine that we're in a global warming phase, and put some numbers on how much change has happened and why this is happening. So how do the IPCC represent climate change physics? Well, let's go back to their reports. Models may be very simple, just a set of statistical assumptions, or very complex global climate models. It's not necessary or possible for them to be correct in all respects, but they must provide a physically consistent representation of processes and scales relevant to the attribution problem in question. That's clear when you're dealing with 30 
plus climate models, or even nine hand-picked ones for your final analysis, that some models will be better than other models. For the purpose of this presentation, I'll focus on the Goddard Institute of Space Studies models. There's two in the final report. Not to pick any favorites, but they're, they're literally rocket scientists at the Goddard Institute, so they're the people who can get you to the moon and back. So I'm hopeful they get their physics right, or to use the IPCC words, provide a physically consistent representation of processes. Okay, so getting back to the report, attribution does not require, and nor does it imply, that every aspect of the response to the causal factor in question is simulated correctly. Sounds like a lawyer wrote that one. It makes me smile, because it's a disclaimer indicating that some of the models are producing results that don't match the measured data, so don't match reality. If the difference between your model result and reality is large, then that's usually a sign that the, you got the physics wrong, so something is missing in the model, was modeled incorrectly. So your model did not provide a physically consistent representation of all the processes. If your bank manager models you a $100 return on investment, but actually only delivers $10, you'll know his model is missing some key elements. So some physical factors were not modeled correctly, causing you to get a lower return on your investment. In the case of complex numeric models, they usually don't exactly reproduce the data measurements. For a large number of reasons, I won't get into it. In the case of the climate models, the IPCC need to multiply their output by a scaling factor, or fudge factor, as we call it. It's cheating, but to be honest, all modelers do it, and it's our dirty little secret. It's not really an issue unless the scaling factors become really large. So in the case of the bank manager, you need to multiply by a scaling factor of 10, which is too large. Determining whether a scaling factor is too large is, uh, is highly subjective. It's a matter of personal preference. I like to keep my models to within 30% uh, of the actual measurements. So scaling factors between, say, 0.7 and 1.3. But that's just my personal preference. So returning to the bank manager example, suppose you and two other investors, the bank managers modeled a return on investment of $100 each. And one investor gets $99, the other gets $101, and you get $100. So the, it averages out to about $100 return on investment. So the scaling factor, the average scaling factor, is 1, which is good. But there is a range, there's a spread of outcomes. So for one investor, you would have had to multiply the, the modeled output by a factor of 0.99, and the other by a factor of 1.01 .01 to get the exact outcome. So there's a range of scaling factors that needs to apply. Now, 0.99 and 1.01 .01 are not large scaling factors, but suppose in a different scenario, one investor gets zero, the other gets 100, and the other gets $200. Now, this spread is significantly larger, and he has to multiply using scaling factors of 0, 1, and 2. So that's a fairly large range of scaling factors that he needs to apply. The large range of scaling factors indicates there's something wrong with his model. If he forecasts a $100 return on investment, but only delivers zero, then you know something's wrong with his model. The physics are not right. There's something wrong with the equations. Now suppose he, uh, in a similar scenario, he now gets an outcome of zero for you, minus 100, so one investor has to, winds up paying money, and 100 for the, for the last investor. So the last investor is pretty well off. He says, yeah, you're spot on, scaling factor one. But the average scaling factor is now zero. And one investor has a scaling factor of minus one. So he's not going to be happy at all. So these examples indicate that the average and the range of scaling factors is an important uh, factor in determining whether your, your models are producing accurate results. So on to the IPCC attribution itself. The climate change attribution technique they've developed is, is called optimal fingerprint analysis and it's unique to the climate sciences. I've never seen it used elsewhere. It does not follow the scientific method, which is the basis for most scientific progress. I'll tell you more about that later. Once again, quoting the IPCC, attribution is defined as the process of evaluating the relative contributions of multiple causal factors to a change or event with an assignment of statistical confidence. And this is, in fact, what they do. They use the climate models to simulate the effects of the natural and anthropogenic forcing separately, then combine the results to match the observed data. So apologies up front for the equations, but it makes things easier to understand. The IPCC GMST attribution can be represented by the following equation. So delta T is a change in temperature. 
delta NF and delta AF are the natural and anthropogenic forcings. And F1 is some function uh, representing the physics of how these natural and anthropogenic forcings combine to produce a temperature effect. Basically, F1 re represents the physics of the model, so what you need to code into your climate model. Optimal fingerprint analysis methodology requires that the temperature response to each forcing is modeled separately. So the relative temperature or energy contribution of each forcing is then determined by comparing the simulation output to the data. Using the equations, the IPCC optimal fingerprint analysis methodology can be represented as this equation, where delta T is once again the change in temperature. S1 delta NF and S2 delta AF are the simulated responses to the forcings. So S1 simulated response to the natural forcings and S2 the simulated response to the anthropogenic forcings. We're still left with a function F2 which determines how these simulated responses can be combined to produce the temperature effect. It's the fingerprints of the simulated responses that give the method its name. So simulated trends or fingerprints are compared to the observed global mean surface temperature trends. The individual responses are then individually scaled and then linearly combined using a third scaling factor to calculate the overall climate response. So IPCC optimal fingerprint analysis therefore assumes that F2 can be represented as a linear combination of the two subfunctions. So the change in temperature equals a scaling factor times another scaling factor times the temperature response of the computer model to the natural forcing plus a scaling factor times the temperature response to the anthropogenic forcing. So three scaling factors are required. So here I'd like to point out three red flags that together indicate that the optimal fingerprint analysis methodology is little more than junk science. First, the anthropogenic and natural forcings are model modeled separately. So natural forcing is kept constant while the anthropogenic forcing is varied and vice versa. Why? This assumes there's no interactions between the two, so actually misrepresents the physics. We know that an increase in solar radiation will increase the re-emitted heat energy and increase the energy captured by greenhouse gases. So why disallow the interaction between the two? Next, the IPCC requires three scaling factors. In common model practice, you only use one. You run your model, you get a simulated value that's slightly too high or slightly too low, and you multiply by a scaling factor. Using three scaling factors allows you to basically model any outcome that you like. Lastly, this equation represents a linear addition of temperatures, which is a huge problem. Temperatures are not additive. A small bucket of 100 degrees Celsius water added to a large pool of 10 degrees Celsius water will not add to a 110 degree Celsius pool, nor does it average to 55 degrees Celsius. You need to convert to energy. Now, IPCC worry about this some and say, well, some say you can, some say you can't, but at the end of the day, they figure, why not? What are you going to do? So how are the scaling factors calculated? This figure comes straight from the attribution report, and it's, it's an example of how it's done. Left shows you the scaled natural, which is the blue line, and scaled anthropogenic model responses, red line, and their combination in black on the global mean surface temperature data. And you see, just as I said at the start of this, of this video, that the simulated anthropogenic line strongly resembles the CO2 curve flat till 1960, then a strong increase up to present. And that's as it should be. That's what I expect. Not that, as mentioned, the IPCC can fit a good line through the 1960 to 2010 data, but not through the 1909 to 1943 increase or the 0.2 degree drop, just as expected as well. And even though this is only an example, you can see the problems in simulating the 1909 to 1943 temperature increase. The anthropogenic scaling factor is derived on the right, which shows a cross plot between observed and simulated responses. Normally it should plot as a straight line if your model is exact, but obviously there's some scatter in this case. Complex climate models do not provide an exact answer. There will always be some scatter. The plot determines the scaling factor that causes the best match. Note the top axis. The line is heavily biased by the post-1960 data and largely ignores the 1909 to 1943 data. This ensures a really good fit between the scaled simulation output and the most recent warming event measurements. We've selected the scaling factor that will cause an optimal fit. Note that the 1909 to 1943 data do not fit the line well. 
The warming occurred during a period of low CO2 concentrations, so low greenhouse gas forcing, and relatively constant natural forcings, and so is poorly predicted by most of the climate models. Also note that the data used are anomalies relative to 1880 to 1920 average and not the 1951 to 1980 average that's commonly used, for example, by NASA. I'm not sure why that is, but you can move the data cloud up and down the horizontal axis by varying the uh, scaling factor, which changes the simulated values. So optimal fingerprint analysis is basically junk science. It's a method that can prove any result that you want it to prove. To show you it produces nonsense results, I'll work through a nonsense example. Now suppose I really, really want to blame Texas for the recent global warming. Some guy Texas stole my girlfriend once, so now I want to get even. Well, everyone knows that Texans like barbecue, and I've got to be in my bonnet that it's probably the barbecue pits that are causing the global warming. Barbecue pits convert fuel into, into energy. Some of it heats the meat, and some of it is lost to the atmosphere. And so I figure for every additional barbecue pit, there's probably 0 0.01 degrees Celsius global warming happening. I have no evidence uh, that that's the case, but a quick and faulty back of the envelope calculation, and I'm convinced, let's go blame Texas. I don't have any numbers for barbecue pits or the generated heat, but I do have census data, so I'll assume that for every additional 50,000 Texans, another barbecue pit opens and the earth warms an additional 0 0.01 degrees Celsius. The average Texas population between 1951 and 1980 is 10.7 million, which was reached around uh, 1967. So we'll call the difference the population anomaly, which can be multiplied by 0 0.05 for 50,000 Texans per barbecue pit to simulate the number of barbecue pits and the resultant temperature increase. Here you can see the Texas population anomaly relative to 1951 to 1980 average. You see it can go negative because relative to 1967, the population was, was less. So next you see my models predict the temperature anomaly versus the actual measured data. Well, that's a pretty good match. I wonder if I'm not on to something here. Maybe Texas is to blame. The greenhouse gas attribution by the IPCC is based on the consistency of the observed and modeled changes across the climate system. Well, my model seems to provide good predictions, except for this pesky 1909 to 1943 heating phase, where it goes wrong. But based on their own rules of attribution, I can say, well, the barbecue pits in Texas uh, seem to match the observ observations fairly well. Not that it doesn't really matter whether a new barbecue pit is open for every 10, 20, 50,000 inhabitants, because we can always correct the output using the fudge factors. If I had selected 0.1 degree Celsius increase for every 10,000 extra inhabitants, this curve would be five times higher. I could fudge it back with a factor of 0.2. In fact, every Texan can have their own barbecue pit. I just fudge it downward using a very small, almost zero fudge factor. Even though I got the physics completely wrong, using an unrealistic fudge factor saves the day. And for simplicity, I've selected a number that will cause the calculated fudge factor to be close to 1, as you can see on this graph here. Also note, my model has problems predicting the 1909 to 1943 increase and the subsequent decrease. Okay, as mentioned, I'm expecting a scaling factor of 1. This graph indicates that. You can select scaling factors that put this line anywhere you want, basically. You just can't use realistic scaling factors. The question to ask is, do you think your model is physically correct if you need to multiply the results with large scaling factors? Because all of this doesn't matter if the scaling factors are reasonable. I mentioned before my personal preferences for factors between 0.7 and 1.3, but ideally it should be close to 1. So how are the IPCC models performing? This is a very busy slide that graphically summarizes scaling factors that are required for the different climate models. As I mentioned before, I'll look at the Goddard Institute models because I am hopeful that they get the physics right. The left side shows the simulated temperature trends per decade of the greenhouse gas in green, other anthropogenic in yellow, and natural forcings in blue. I ignore the yellow lines for now. The scaling factors on the right are the multipliers necessary to get the climate model models to accurately match the Hadley Center Climate Research Unit gridded surface data. Now that's a mouthful. Basically, a grid was laid out over the Earth's surface, and the historical temperature data was compiled per grid cell. Each grid cell has their own temperature history, so each grid cell requires its own scaling factors. New York is in one cell, Tokyo is in another. Climate models were run, and the simulated output was compared to reality cell by cell. So the scaling factors form a distribution similar to the three investors example that I just presented uh, previously. 
If the climate models are reasonably accurate, and if all the simulation cell values roughly match reality, then the average scaling factor should be close to 1, and there's a narrow range. The required scaling factor results are compared for three, three data sets. The squares are the average scaling factor for the 1901 to 2010 data, so the data set that I've been showing you up till now. Triangle markers are for the 1951 to 2010 data, and diamonds are the 1861 to 2010 data. So that's the full data set. First off, why are there two models? As a modeler, I can tell you there's a strong preference to have only one model. As someone traveling to the moon, you don't want to be told by the Goddard Institute that two models exist. Pick one. Either one might get you there, but we don't really know which. The reason is that the two models represent different physics, so different mathematical representations of climate change, because else the scaling factors would be identical. So two models indicates that the physics is so uncertain that you require two different models to model two different physical realities. The physics in one doesn't match the physics in the other. This, despite temperature not exactly being rocket science, you should be able to get a reasonable estimate using the back of an envelope calculation without a complex model. Let me point out another red flag. The scaling factor data is cut off at minus one and plus two. This is what we in the modeling industry call putting lipstick on a pig. It's a common modeling trick that hides the true range, which apparently extends to some staggeringly large scaling factors. In fact, the lack of any squares on this graph seems to indicate that the average scaling factors for the 1901 to 2010 data are literally off the chart, so really, really large. And the boundaries are bad enough. Minus one means the simulations were off in direction. An increase was predicted, but a decrease was measured. You want to go to the moon, but Goddard has sent you hurling towards the sun. And you're subtracting temperatures. How does that work? One, one of the forcings is cooling the other one? The fact is zero means that a change was predicted, but none measured. Well, that's awkward. Where did the energy go? The factor of point zero, point 0.1 means that you've overpredicted by a factor of 10, and a factor of 2 means you've un underpredicted by 50%. They're all worrying, but still, accidents happen. Sometimes locations are erratic. More worrying are the average values. If these are off, that means you've got the physics wrong. Neither model accurately predicts the 1901 to 2010 data, as we've just seen. We're not even in the ballpark. This is mainly because, as we saw before, you can't predict the 1909 to 1943 warming period if your greenhouse gas is the dominant forcing. The data doesn't support this. More on that below. The upper model on the surface doesn't look too bad for the other two data sets. Neither did my Texas barbecue model. We're slightly overpredicting greenhouse gas warming, but seriously overpredicting the natural forcing, especially for the full data set. The lower model is much worse, completely off in direction for the greenhouse gas, for the recent data set, and far overpredicting for the full data set, but doing reasonably well for the natural forcing. So what you see is fairly common for a faulty model, because something is missing, a natural forcing is missing, you can kind of sort of get one variable to match, but not the other one. I don't show you this to poke fun at the IPCC, requires a serious effort to get a complex model to predict accurately. The three points I want to make are, it's clear to me that the physics are unclear to the rocket scientists. You have two models with two different mathematical representations of the physics, you have widely ranging results, you have one forcing right, the other becomes wrong, and so on. The second point is, these are not stable models. They're hugely sensitive to input data, as the results range widely. They don't get two most recent warming periods right, they're way off. How confident can we be in a model that doesn't even get the last two warming periods right? How confident are we that these models can predict the future? Third point is, these models form the basis of the IPCC climate attribution, the good match between the climate models and the observations is in fact only possible by using unrealistic scaling factors, or only comparing the most recent warming period. The consistency between the simulations and observations is a myth. If I went to my managers demanding a trillion euro investment based on these models, they'd only catch their breath from laughing in my face to tell me I was fired. Yet here we are. Our politicians are determined to spend billions based on these seriously flawed models. Models are tools to be used to better understand the physics behind climate change. There's an old adage, models should be used, not believed. The IPCC climate model results should not be believed, but they can be used to investigate reality. The strong signal coming from these models is, the IPCC has missed at least one significant forcing. I'll show you that forcing in the second companion video. So the IPCC climate attribution proceeds with these unrealistic scaling factors and only for the 1951 to 2010 data. The main conclusion from the 
optimal fingerprint analysis exercise is summarized as more than half of the observed increase in global mean surface temperature from 1951 to 2010 is very likely due to the observed anthropogenic increase in greenhouse gas concentrations. Very likely is a defined IPCC term that means with over 90% probability. The attribution analysis assesses likely ranges for the amounts of 1951 to 2010 warming that is attributable to various factors. So the magnitude is in bars here. Whiskers are uncertainty. The bulk of the observed 0.6 degrees Celsius warming is attributed to greenhouse gases with very little influence of the natural forcings, so solar radiation and volcanics. It may surprise you that despite all the climate model issues that I agree with the IPCC conclusions on solar radiation not being responsible for climate change. A visual inspection of the solar radiation data indicates that since 1900, solar radiation varies cyclically with solar cycles, but does not appear to be significantly increasing. We don't even notice these fluctuations. You don't tell your kids to put a jacket on because we're in a solar cycle low. You don't even notice it. It's part of the steady state. But I do not agree with that if it's not solar radiation, then it must be greenhouse gases. There's an important natural force in missing from the IPCC attribution analysis. I just demonstrated above that there had to be. But first, I'd like to demonstrate that the IPCC greenhouse gas attribution, the conclusion that radiative forcing due to greenhouse gases is the dominant heating process, is not supported by the data. Once again, apologies for the equations. I know they're confusing to some, but they're necessary to debunk the IPCC attribution analysis. So from where we left off, natural forcing, as defined by the IPCC, apparently has no effect on the change in temperature, so it's a constant, part of the steady state. This means that temperature change is mostly a function of the anthropogenic forcing, which is dominated by the greenhouse gas forcing, which is dominated by carbon dioxide. That's not my conclusion. We just saw that the IPCC also claimed this. This was a conclusion I just quoted from the IPCC report. And why else are politicians spending billions combating CO2 emissions? So this is summarized by this equation, which provides a mathematical formulation of the so-called consensus view that CO2 emissions are causing global warming. A prerequisite for causation is covariation or correlation. If A is causing B, then a change in A should cause a change in B. This is easy to verify because according to Wikipedia, the change in radiative forcing due to CO2 can be approximated by this equation, where C0 is the original CO2 level and C is the new CO2 level. The cross plot reveals there's no correlation whatsoever between the changes in radiative forcing due to CO2 and the 1900 to 2019 temperature data. Left, you can see the data using a yearly interval, so the yearly change in CO2 concentrations versus the yearly change in temperature. This is what's known in science as a buckshot pattern, an almost perfect non-correlation between two variables. R squared is a measure of how much of the temperature change variability is due to CO2, and it's 1%, not more than 50% as claimed by the IPCC. Of course, the yearly temperature data does show some scatter, so an argument can be made that we should use 10-year intervals or decadal intervals. Surely on a decadal scale, the influence of CO2 should be clearly seen in the temperature data. A 10-year plot is not much better. For now, I want you to understand the importance of this graph. The IPCC optimal fingerprint analysis modeling methodology has led to a nonsense conclusion that's disproven by this graph. If I'd only used the 1951 to 2019 data set, the correlation would have been much better, but that's the whole point. Without looking at the GISS climate model results, I can predict they will never get anywhere near a decent match to the 1900 to 2019 data. They can't because there's no relationship between CO2 and temperature. Another important conclusion from this cross plot is that there's no point in combating CO2. This graph tells you that reducing CO2 is just as likely to increase the temperature as it is to decrease it. All this can be seen as mud throwing. If I'm so clever, then what is causing climate change? In the second video, I'll present the evidence that a natural forcing is causing climate change, or forcing that does show a statistically significant correlation with the Earth's varying energy. Meanwhile, let's try to get the Texas barbecue pits off the hook. Note that I assumed a linear model between population and temperature. And note that despite my impressive ability to forecast temperature increases, the correlation is truly absent, as expected. The main problem remains the 1909 to 1943 half a degree, half degree Celsius increase and the 1944 to 1955 0.2 degree decrease that don't correlate at all 
as population increases. This is as close as you can come to demonstrating innocence. At this point, I'd like to go on a sidebar on the scientific method. I mentioned that optimal fingerprint analysis is a technique exclusively used by the climate scientists and doesn't follow the classic scientific method as formulated by Karl Popper. It's an important distinction, and one that separates the conspiracy theories from the plausible theories from the proven theories. Karl Popper formulated a theory called empirical falsification, whereby science evolves and understanding of the universe increases when a null hypothesis is falsified. That sounds complex, but it should become clearer with an example. A null hypothesis states that an event, something that happens, does not change our scientific understanding. So a new record high temperature in Amsterdam doesn't mean a thing until you demonstrate that it does. A scientist who wants to argue that an event does change our understanding must falsify the null hypothesis, and usually does so by demonstrating that the null hypothesis has low probability. So for, as an example, suppose your significant other claims that you have an outside love interest. Your first reaction is probably, if that's true or not, it's not true. You state your null hypothesis. There is no relationship between me and an outside love interest. Your next reaction is probably, why would you even think so, sweetheart? The reason could be, it came to me in a dream. We were sitting in a bus. You were flirting which is really not enough evidence to scientifically reject the null hypothesis. It's similar to a conspiracy theory, little or no physical evidence to falsify the null hypothesis. Well, it could be I hacked your email account and found some new selfies you'd sent. That's probably enough evidence. The probability that your null hypothesis is true is now vanishingly small. So getting back to climate change, I could state that I believe the Illuminati have a heat ray on the dark side of the moon, and that's causing climate change. There's no evidence to support such a statement, so the null hypothesis, no relationship between climate change and Illuminati heat rays, has a long way to go before it can be rejected. The complete lack of evidence relegates it to conspiracy status. The Texas barbecue pit story sounds plausible until you calculate the energies involved are too low to cause, cause any temperature change. The physics just don't work. Getting back to climate change, the IPCC climate change attribution in effect looks at falsifying two null hypotheses. There's no relationship between the natural forcings and the observed data. There's no relationship between the anthropogenic forcings and the observed data. The IPCC present ample evidence that the natural forcing null hypothesis cannot be rejected. You can't demonstrate innocence. It remains a plausible theory that changes in the solar radiation forcing can cause climate change. But there's not nearly enough evidence to falsify the null hypothesis. Solar radiation changes are likely not responsible for the recent temperature increase. However, the IPCC do not present evidence that the anthropogenic null hypothesis can be rejected. We just saw a complete lack of correlation between CO2 radiative, radiative forcing and Texas population changes and the temperature change. It's as if you have two prime suspects, Bill and Bob, and you demonstrate it's not Bill, so it must be Bob. That's only true if your list of suspects is complete, so it can't be Bruce or Ben. The IPCC analysis is missing an important natural forcing one that can be proven via the scientific method to be warming the earth. So watch the second video where I'll introduce you to Bruce. Note that covariation or correlation is a requirement to prove causation. The IPCC claimed the rise of atmospheric CO2 is causing climate change, but failed to clear this hurdle by a long shot. There is no correlation between the two. So that's the meat of the IPCC attribution analysis. Are you impressed? Using a self-invented method, optimal fingerprint analysis, that doesn't follow the traditional scientific method, that requires an unprecedented three scaling factors that take on completely unrealistic values, the IPCC climate model still cannot match the 1901 to 2010 global mean surface temperature data. Remember the quote from the IPCC report, greenhouse gas attribution is based on the consistency of observed and models changes across the climate system. So the greenhouse gas attribution is obviously faulty as the models do not match reality. In fact, there's no positive evidence that CO2 even plays a role. The IPCC climate models are clearly missing a natural forcing, like the natural forcing I present in the next video. Note that its time series data much better predict the 1909 to 1943 warming, the post-World War II decrease in temperature, and the recent temperature increase. So the time series fingerprints of the global mean surface temperature data do not match the climate model predictions. Let's see how well the models match its geographical fingerprints. 
The left is the outgoing heat map for the 2003 to 2011 period. This is the raw input to the radiative forcing to the greenhouse gas process. More radiated heat means more greenhouse gas capture means more radiated heat back to the earth. Now it looks nothing like the observed ocean temperature increases on the right, which comes straight from the IPCC report. Note that the data is presented as heating trends in degrees Celsius per decade. Red is heating, blue is cooling. Either major unmodeled forcing is redistributing the heat due to radiative forcing, due to greenhouse gases, or an unmodeled forcing is heating the oceans. Either way, there's a significant forcing missing from the IPCC climate models. You can't get heat that's accumulating near the equator all the way up to the Arctic, which is currently heating faster than anywhere else, or transfer massive amounts of heat from the Pacific to the Atlantic. According to the IPCC's own reports, during the last two multi-decadal global warming periods, so 1909 to 1941 and 1980 to present, the Northern Hemisphere was heating more than the Southern Hemisphere, the Northern Atlantic was heating more than the Pacific and Southern Oceans, and the Arctic was heating more than the other regions, and mainly heating during its winter. As stated by the IPCC, over the period 1979 to 2010, most observed regions exhibited warming, and then there's, I've left out some, but much of the Eastern Pacific and Southern Oceans cooled. These regions of cooling are not seen in the simulated trends over this period in response to anthropogenic and natural forcing. So the climate models cannot explain it. More evidence of an unmodeled forcing that's heating the Northern Atlantic and the Arctic. It's also visually apparent that the Northern Atlantic is heating more than the Pacific or Southern Oceans. Such was also reported for the 1900 to 1945 warming period. And once again, a quote from the IPCC report. The most pronounced warming occurred in the Arctic during the cold season, followed by North America during the warm season, the North Atlantic Ocean, and the tropics, indicating that the previous multi-decadal warming period, so 1900 to 1940, also favored the Arctic and Northern Atlantic. During the winter, how does that work when the Arctic is emitting no heat? Any warming due to radiated forcing due to greenhouse gases is literally on the other side of the Earth. This shows that the net heat loss of the Arctic now, even the Illuminati heat ray seems more likely than greenhouse gas warming of the Arctic during the winter. So what does heating the Arctic look like? Here's some data from the Danish Meteorological Institute for the Arctic temperatures north of the 80th parallel. On the vertical are the temperature anomalies, and on the horizontal the years between 1960 to 2019. So red are the summer temperature anomalies, which remain relatively constant, and blue are the winter temperature anomalies that confirm that the Arctic is warming during the winter. Since 2000, it appears to have warmed by 6 to 8 degrees, which is far above the global average. It's extremely difficult to explain why the summer periods do not show a significant temperature rise if radiative forcing due to greenhouse gases is the dominant heating forcing. There's apparently no capturing of, by greenhouse gases when it should be at a maximum. Solar radiation forcing is also absent during the winter months, so the data unequivocally show that an unrecognized natural forcing is heating the Arctic Ocean and is causing temperature increases during the winter months, a natural forcing that has not been modeled by the IPCC. Differences in IPCC-recognized natural or anthropogenic forcings cannot explain why the high-latitude offshore Greenland seas, over here, where solar irradiation forcing and emitted heat are relatively low due to the high angle of solar incidence, why these seas show a significantly higher temperature trend than, for example, the cooling seas to the east of Australia. In addition, these North Atlantic heat anomalies should, in theory, dissipate their heat to the cooler surrounding waters unless a heat pump is locally act actively maintaining this energy gradient. Now, several secondary processes could, in theory, pump heat energy against the energy gradient to the Northern Atlantic. For example, the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation was investigated. But IPCC climate models could not identify any process that reproduces the location or the magnitude of these observed trends, for example, from the report. Studies that find a significant role for the AMO, the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, show that this does not project strongly onto the 1951 to 2010 temperature trends. This lack of heat dissipation and a lack of a viable large-scale energy pump suggests that a significant unmodeled process is warming some of the major ocean currents in situ. Now let's look at the third dimension, ocean depth. Uh, these figures come straight from the IPCC reports. The figure on the upper right shows ocean depth on the vertical versus latitude on the horizontal axis. And it's clear that the northern hemisphere is heating far more than the southern hemisphere, and that these heat anomalies extend throughout the entire upper ocean layer. Now look at the lower right graph. 
This shows ocean depth on the vertical versus years between 1955 and 2010 on the horizontal. The role of the uppermost layer, so the upper 75 meter layer, of these oceans bears further investigation. Its temperature and energy properties are clearly distinct from the lowermost ocean layer, so the 75 to 700 meter layer, as is reflected by a significant difference in temperature gradients. Note that this upper layer is the only layer that directly interacts with solar irradiation energy. Sunlight usually does not penetrate further than 75 meters depth into the ocean. It's also the only layer that directly interacts with the atmosphere, so losing heat to the cold atmosphere or absorbing any heat to the radiative forcing to the greenhouse gases. This figure shows that this layer was losing energy, so cooling, up to about 1990. Heat energy was being lost to the atmosphere. This heat was partially replenished by this lower layer. It's also cooling, but not as much, so it's losing energy, likely to this upper layer. The cooling stopped around the mid-70s, as you can see here. This means that the heat loss to the upper layer, which will still continue up to 1990 at least, is being compensated by a forcing that's heating this layer. This forcing is not radiated forcing to the greenhouse gases, as this energy would have to pass through the upper layer, and it clearly doesn't. This graph shows the upper ocean layer energy content in black on the vertical versus years on the horizontal, and it's also from the IPCC volume 10. It shows that the upper 700 meter ocean layer, the upper uppermost and lowermost layers together, are heating significantly since the mid 1970s. So how does that work if the energy is coming from the radiative forcing to the greenhouse gases, but not passing through the upper 75 meter layer? It's not physically possible. The Earth lost significant amounts of energy between 1955 and 1968, this despite increasing CO2 levels. Now that's energy that's lost to space, that's not coming back. How does the radiative forcing to the greenhouse gas recapture that lost energy? It's not physically possible. I'd like to present one last fingerprint of this mysterious natural forcing, which will give you an idea of where the second video will go. Now this is a display of the albedo change as calculated by NASA. Albedo is notoriously difficult to measure on the Earth's surface, so researchers calculate it from satellite data acquired from the CIRES program, the Clouds and Earth Radiant Energy System program. The instruments use scanning radiometers to measure both the solar energy reflected by the planet, so that's albedo, and the long wave thermal energy emitted by it. The map shows how the Earth's calculated albedo changed between March 1st, 2000, and December 31st, 2011. NASA's conclusion, at the North Pole, reflectivity decreased markedly as a result of the declining sea ice on the Arctic Ocean and increasing dust and soot on the top of the ice. Around the South Pole, the reflectivity is down around West Antarctica and up slightly in parts of East Antarctica, but there's no net gain or loss. The research calculated that the overall albedo of the Arctic region fell from 52% to 48% between 1979 and 2011. The measured magnitude was twice as large as expected, i.e. twice as large as that was found in previous studies. Now, I certainly agree that due to the melting of the Arctic ice, the average albedo will decrease. It's open ocean versus ice. But the areas of the Arctic that remain covered in ice, mainly the area to the north of Canada and Greenland, show a larger decrease than the areas that are regularly open ocean during the summer months. NASA attribute this to dust and soot, which is nonsensical. Dust-covered ice will still have a much higher albedo and open oceans. The mystery natural process is heating the oceans. We saw that in the Danish data. So this extra heating of the Arctic is likely causing computational errors. A change in emitted heat energy could be interpreted as a de decrease in albedo. So more heat energy emitted implies more energy absorbed, implies less energy reflected, implies a lower calculated albedo. The fact that such heating occurs furthest away from where radiative forcing due to greenhouse gases should be at a maximum, but close to the magnetic poles, suggests that magnetism plays a role. This is confirmed by the Antarctic data, where Thwaites Glacier and the western edge of the Ross Ice Shelf are melting from below, suggesting that oceans proximal to the South Pole are also heating. In conclusion, I'd like to summarize that there's actually very little positive data indicating that radiative forcing to the greenhouse gases is playing a significant role in heating the Earth. The IPCC have based their conclusions on unstable climate models that do not accurately simulate reality. Their analysis does not follow the scientific method and relies on a process of elimination. If it's not solar radiation, then it must be CO2, the only climate variable that is increasing. This is only true if their analysis of forcings is complete, so there's no other natural forcing that is heating the planet.
If you agree that the IPCC have overstated their case, I would encourage you to write, text, or tweet your political representatives and ask them to organize an independent review of the IPCC reports before spending more money fighting CO2. With that, I'd like to end this presentation and encourage you to watch video two, which will demonstrate the natural forcing that is responsible for climate change and does show a statistically significant correlation to their energy variability.